Our church, when someone leaves, it always leaves a hole in our hearts. Those of you who have been here for a while, and maybe some of you have been here not for a while, but you've, you've learned that pain. Or if you've lived other places as an expat, the pain of people coming and going and the constantly forming attachments and then losing them. Sometimes it gets too hard for people. Sometimes I know of locals who have lived here and gone through it so much, they don't want to make friends with foreigners because they say it's just too hard, it's too painful. I know they're going to be gone in a year or two. It's not worth the investment. And yet in our church, we continue to do that. We welcome new people. We reach out. We embrace them. We make friendships. We have them over for meals. We celebrate things with them. We have births of babies recently or weddings or whatever's going on. And we know that either they're going to leave or we're going to leave. At least that's often the case. Yes, there are some that have stayed it out for years and years, but the majority of our church, I mean, I've often said we're a church of 100 a year, but 1,000 in a decade, because so many people have come through the doors, um, and we, we miss them dearly. And so it's tough being in an international church, but it's also a wonderful experience. And we wouldn't have this church to be a part of if it wasn't for having leaders, now, each of us plays a part in the church. We are each supposed to be involved in the service and in engaging. We each have different talents, spiritual gifts, resources that God has given you, and you have a role to play. There's, all of us are, have a, are a part of the body. There's nobody that's like, well, I mean, <laughs> we've often joked, you know, is there anybody who is the spiritual appendix? We don't really know why they're here, but I guess there was a purpose. No, everybody has a purpose in the body of Christ. But in the Bible, there are certain roles that are called out that have oversight of leadership that help the church to continue. I am immensely thankful for the people in 1973 who founded this church. It was the current president of Phillips Petroleum Company and a couple other families from Phillips. Phillips was one of the first companies, if I guess the first company actually of all, to come into Norway and uh, help figure out how to get the oil out. So generous of them to want to come and help the Norwegians figure this out. And of course, in the years that came after that, many more major multinational oil companies came in and the NATO base and all these things. And over the years, some have left. Over my time here, we've seen, you know, Exxon has left and Marathon and others. And the world continues to change around us. But we're so thankful we've had this church through it all, through the ups and the downs. But as God gives different leaders to the church, we have something that's called ordination. And it's not something we do very often, and it's not something we do for everyone. And I want to talk about that for a few minutes this morning, and what that means, and what we're going to be doing next Sunday. Ordination is not a word you will find in the Bible, in the New Testament. You're not going to find this clearly laid out. As a matter of fact, I would say there's not a clear prescription for ordination, and it's left somewhat to interpretation. If you think about it, much of what we have when it comes to church structure does not come from Jesus' own words in the Gospels. He talks about building his church, but he doesn't say clearly there's going to be elders or deacons. or right? that, that he leaves for later, and the Spirit's leading with the apostles. And so one of the difficult things when we look at Scripture is figuring out which parts of Scripture are prescriptive and which are descriptive. Which ones are ones that you say, this is how it has to happen every time, and which ones was it, well, in this case, in this church, this was a way it worked, or in this culture, and maybe we need to adapt it differently in a different setting. So our church, we have pastors, we have deacons. Other churches, even Baptists, are set up differently. Some have more elders, some don't have deacons. Thinking about like Rick Warren's church out in California, many of you know of who he is with the Purpose Driven Church and this church Saddleback. They don't have deacons in name. They have many people who serve the same functions, though. He says, well, we have the, the processes in place. He doesn't believe that we have to have people with the title, but rather the issue is making sure the church is cared for. And so in general, in the, in the New Testament, we see these two different areas, which we'll look at in just a minute, of pastors and deacons to care for two different areas of the church, but it doesn't necessarily have to even have the same titles. Obviously, we're speaking English. It wasn't written in English. Other churches, other places, if it's a house church or like Bill's church where he talks about thousands of people watching. They have, well, Christmas before last, they had like 5,500 people in church on, on I was going to say a Sunday, on a Friday because it's in Dubai. Uh, now they don't have anybody in church and they're all uh, at home. So it's a bit of a, a bit odd for them. It's hard for them to keep track of all their people. But it depends on the size of the church, how it's going to be structured and organized. I think what matters most is God is a God of 
or, of being organized, of being orderly. He's not a god of chaos. Uh, but let's look for a few minutes at what is this term ordination? What does it even mean? Not all of us speak English as a first language, and those of us that do may still struggle with this word. So here's where it comes from in the Latin, from ordinera, which means to put in order. And as it transforms into ordination, literally it's arrangement in order. It has a mathematical connotation. It also has a religious connotation. But I want to be careful with that because we come from so many different church backgrounds. That some of you may view ordination and just got to have the guy with the fancy hat and a big cane and all this. And some of you, I mean, if you go search pictures of ordination on the internet, you find all sorts of different things. And some churches have very established processes for it. And some churches, I think, think it's actually like prescribed in the Bible. And it's, it's not. There's no hats and there's no canes. And these things are, are traditions that have grown up. And they may have their purpose. But I want to explain what it means in our church. But so first, just the root of it is to put in order. To be orderly, to be organized. You read about Paul and in the New Testament, Paul is very clear about don't have chaos in church. You shouldn't have people speaking up and speaking over each other, but it should be orderly. When we, when we are organized and orderly, it's a form of worshiping God. Worship is not just music. Everything we do is a form of worship. And so to be ordained is to put someone in order. Now theoretically, we could do this with everyone in the church. We could ordain everybody into their position. But we see it expressed specifically in two types of overarching leadership in the New Testament, and so we've reserved it for that. So let's look here for just a minute. First, we'll start in Titus 1.5. I'm going to go through quite a few verses, and I've got them all on the board, but you're free to look them up as well. But Titus 1.5, Paul writing to Titus, This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Paul largely gives us the structure of the church in the New Testament. He was a very educated man. He was, he was educated in both secular education, he was educated as, I mean, he spoke multiple languages, he had all the religious education, he was a Roman citizen by birth. Uh, and so he helped to put a lot of orderliness into the church. And so he left Titus there to put in order. You see this idea of ordaining. But let's go back before that, before even Paul. I'm not going to preach through this as much as I love preaching this passage. Many of you have heard me preach it. It's such a foundational, there's so, much, so many foundational points of leadership in this short passage. But I just want to focus on something briefly here. Acts chapter 6, verses 2 through 4 and verse 6. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples. Who's the full number of the disciples? That's you all. They got the church together. That's what it's saying. It's not saying the 12 or the 72, but rather they got the church body, the family, which was, we know, over 3,000 at this point, and said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Nothing wrong with serving tables, but the bottom line is there were physical needs in the church that weren't being met. And they said, we shouldn't do that. We need to focus on the word and on prayer. So he says, so pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. So pick out seven more to help us out. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So they're going to continue to focus on the spiritual things. But the physical needs in the church are also important. So they pick out and they name the seven there. And then it says, these they set before the apostles and they prayed and laid their hands on them. It never says that they were ordained. But this is the term that we apply to laying on of hands and appointing someone to a position of leadership, is to ordain them. Now again, depending on your church background, there may be lots of rules for this or how it's done, and that's why even, even within Norway, even within Baptists in Norway, it's not, <laughs> the way we do it isn't exactly the same as how the Norwegian Baptists do it. It's definitely different than how the State Church of Norway does it. And so again, depending on your background, you may have all kinds of ideas, and that's why I just wanted to take time today to make sure that we're on the same page, that this is what it means for North Sea. Is we are setting somebody apart for a role, and we do this with our deacons. Many of you have been here. Uh, Bill Frank, who moved this summer, he was the most recent deacon we ordained a year or two ago, and we go through a similar process there. Because I see in this passage that this is our, our beginning of having pastors and deacons. It's apostles and it's the chosen seven, but in reality we see that there's one group, the apostles, who are in charge of the spiritual needs, and there's another group, these seven, who are overseeing the physical. 
they're not the only people dealing with the physical needs. There's got to be a whole team of people who are cooking meals, who are helping distribute them. It's not these seven dudes doing all that work by themselves. I believe one of them managed each day of the week, and that's why there's seven. But that's open to interpretation. But the point is, they had lots of other people who were not ordained, but they oversaw the overarching ministry of it. And so these two oversight roles, pastors, primarily spiritual needs, deacons, primarily practical needs. And I say primarily because the deacons need to be spiritual people as well. And the pastors are also concerned with physical needs. As a matter of fact, ultimately we see, if we, if we relate the apostles to pastors, we see they're over everything. They're the ones appointing the deacons. They're the ones making sure those things are taken care of, but they're delegating out responsibility because it's too much for anybody to do by themselves. And ultimately, the whole church is brought into this. Everybody is trained. If we know from Ephesians that we have pastors and teachers, evangelists, we have these different people that God has given to the church, prophets and apostles, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service. So every single one of you is supposed to be engaged in the work of service in the church. It's not just for pastors and deacons. But these are two overarching roles, that without these two roles of oversight, the church won't function. If we didn't have, and in our church, our deacons, well, they do sometimes, we will, we will spend time praying for people. We've had people come, we've even anointed them with oil and prayed over them and things like that as the deacons. But primarily their role is they have to be trustees for the government. In, for our incorporation in Norway as well as in the U.S. They have to make sure the finances are being handled in an ethical and, and moral way and, and in a way that's in cooperation with the government. They help make sure that we get the money we should get from the government. Um, they help make sure that all of our rent and other things are in line, that our properties, that they oversee the, the management of the house that we own as a church. So the practical things that they take on. There's also good ethical reasons for that not to all fall under pastoral leadership because there's always questions of making sure there's not corruption. I want to be above reproach. And so having other people managing the money makes, makes good, wise sense. Um, and then from the pastoral perspective, we've got all the, the preaching and the teaching and the prayer and these things that fall under that. And so as a church, we have these two roles. And we've had many different people over the years in both of these roles. Now, the reason we're talking about this today is because two years ago, you, or those of you who were here at the time and were members of the church, voted to bring Rebecca on as our pastor of ministries. And so Rebecca's here in the back. If we're talking about missing people earlier, many of us have been missing her for the last six weeks. And we are uh, very glad. It's very nice to see her back here with us today. But Rebecca's been serving in that role for the last couple of years. But we've never ordained her to the gospel ministry. This setting aside, setting apart. So what does that mean if we're going to ordain her? Because that's what we're talking about today and doing next week. Well, we see, what did they do? They set them before the apostles and they prayed and laid their hands on them. We see this idea of laying hands throughout the Bible in Acts chapter 9, talking about Saul or Paul. He had seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. In Hebrews chapter 6, 1 and 2, Therefore let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God and of instruction about washings, the laying on of hands. I'm reading this to say, Hebrews sees this as basic. Laying on of hands is something that we've seen throughout the Bible as a way that God sometimes confers grace. We see Jesus laying hands on a man's eyes that he might receive his sight. We see this is a basic thing that we do in the church as we are bestowing blessings. So ordination, it's a confirmation of calling by the local church and a conferring of blessing. That's the quickest, easiest way to put, to put it. So basically, it's a chance for us as a church family to confirm that we see in Rebecca a calling on her life and that we want to confirm that publicly. That's something that she can take with her as she goes to other churches in the future. I'd like to think that God is going to keep Yost here forever, and he won't retire until he's like 100. But in reality, we know they probably won't be here forever, and they'll go somewhere else. Well, the question is, do we think Rebecca is just here filling a job, or is this a calling on her life? We've had a number of pastors come and help over the years. In the last year or so, we've had Ed and Marion come. We've had Mike and Maggie. When you think about Ed or Mike, they're both retired. Does that mean they're not pastors anymore? You see a calling on their life, don't you? I remember Kim Blackaby, when 
Tom Blackaby was a pastor, a pastor before me, and his wife Kim. And when, before they moved, she said to me, and, and it was, I think she was a bit concerned about Tom, because he was leaving the pastorate to work with his brother Richard and his father in the Blackaby Ministries. And she said, you know, you can take the pastor out of the church, but you can't take the church out of the pastor. And lo and behold, Tom stayed for seven years with his brother, but he was never really fully joyful in that. And then he went back to pastoring and pastors outside of Vancouver now. And I remember last year um, in Bangkok, I think it was last year, I was with Richard, his, his big brother. And Richard has been doing this itinerant ministry all over the world. And Richard told me, he said, all I've ever wanted to do is just be a pastor, but God doesn't let me do that. So the point being is, these people have a call in their life to pastoral ministry. It doesn't matter if they're in an official position or if they're just with a small group, but there's just something about them that is pastoral. That we say God has called them to help shepherd people, to lead them. So if we see that as a church family, then we should be confirming that. And then when she goes to another church, she's able to say, I've been ordained. It was a church, and that's more important to many churches than even a, a resume that says you had a job. But it's to say there was a local church that believed in me and that confirmed my calling. And that means a lot in the ministry. It means a lot in a lot of churches. Most churches will accept ordinations from other churches. Sometimes a church wants to reordain in their own place. But usually a church will accept that. But it is usually a requirement of ministry. Now, when we actually talk about confirmation, we'll be giving her a certificate. And it says, we, the undersigned, upon the recommendation and request of the North Sea Baptist Church. You say, wait, when do we recommend a request? Well, again, two years ago, you voted on her being a pastor of ministries. So this has been a long process. At Stavanger, Norway, which had full and sufficient opportunity for judging the God-given gifts. Now, you have. You've had a couple of years. Nobody has come to me in those two years and said, oh, my goodness, what a mistake. What have you done? If you've been sitting on that, well, this is the week to come talk to me. And I'm not kidding. It'll be anonymous. If there's some concern, it came up, not with her there, but yesterday, without her present, one of the, um, one of the people in the ordination council, talk about that in a minute, said, you know, that he has known two pastors who seem like great guys, but they've both been arrested for child abuse. It's a serious issue. And he said, so anybody could have skeletons in a closet. Now, I have worked with Rebecca for two years quite closely. The very fact that she's put up with meeting with me on a weekly basis for two years is a huge thing in her favor of her character. But anybody can have skeletons. This is why we have that time of testing over the last two years. And so, of course, you should speak up if you feel there is something that has been missed. But we've had this full, sufficient opportunity for judging the God-given gifts. And after satisfactory examination by us, well, let's stop and talk about that just briefly here. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10, it's talking about deacons, but it says, and let them also be tested first. Well, if it applies to deacons, it's got to apply to pastoral work as well. I think it's just that it was clear with pastoral work, it says, don't let them be new believers. They're clearly supposed to have already been tested. Some of that has been the last two years. But it also says here, chapter 5, do not be hasty in the laying on of hands. So it's something that we take very seriously, that we want, don't want to rush into. I feel that we've seen fruit from our ministry. I've heard from others who've said the same, so we've seen that. But of course, again, feel free to, to make appointment or talk to me this week if you feel there's something we've missed. And then Titus chapter 1 verse 9 says that the elder must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction and sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Well, that's what yesterday was about. We had a very long ordination council involving those who have been ordained in our church, as well as those from other churches, people like Magnar Mayland, which so many of you will know. He used to be the General Secretary of the Baptist Union in Norway. Um, another Ger uh, Barlop that some will know. He's a military chaplain. Um, so we had some other pastors as well. Joeli from SIC would have been there, but unfortunately he had come down with a cough and was concerned about being quarantined, so he was not able to be with us. Um, Bill Frank was with us virtually, so it was nice to have him with us as well from Houston. And so we had this time of asking questions, and they asked all sorts of questions. Nothing was off limits. It was a time of asking her everything from how does she define the gospel, how does she understand salvation, how does she understand women in ministry. Everything was asked, and um, she did a fantastic job of answering the questions. Um, it's important that anybody who is in pastoral ministry can at least give answers. We don't have to always agree, but needs to be able to formulate a well-thought-out position. And she was able to do that very well. 
After she left, the council convened. We, we talked about how it went. Some of the feedback that I got from different council members was they were impressed with her calm and peaceful demeanor, impressed with her knowledge and depth, that she takes the time, uh, that she takes time to really weigh her words, that she had a sincere, strong biblical knowledge. One said, what a blessing, what a woman, lots of experience, no reservations. She's reflective, clear, has deep knowledge about God, and yet also has a heart for the people, and that's a wonderful combination. So it was very positive. We had a vote. It was unanimous to move forward with the ordination from the council. So back to the document. After satisfactory examination by us in regard to the Christian experience, call to the ministry, we spent a lot of time about that, and views of Bible doctrine, that we hereby certify that, and then her name was solemnly and publicly set apart and ordained to the work of, gospel, of the gospel ministry by the authority of the church. This is something we do as a church. So that council happened yesterday. It went very well, as I said. And so now the next step is for us to have an ordination service and actually lay hands and pray for her on Sunday, October 18th. We're still figuring out exactly laying on of hands with COVID. There'll be lots of anti back involved. But it's an important rite and it's an important process that we have as a church. So next Sunday, unless something comes up this week, and again, that's in your court, then next Sunday I'm very excited that we will be having an ordination service. Uh, Pastor Magnar Malin will be here to preach. We're going to have communion. We would have done it this Sunday, but we decided to wait until next week. We're going to have some other things going along. Jimmy Martin was supposed to be here. We scheduled this months and months ago. We kept thinking the pandemic would be over. But for him to fly in from Germany just didn't make sense. He would have had to come for two whole weeks of quarantine. So he is sending a short video, but Magnar is instead taking his place to preach, which we are very grateful for. So that will be next Sunday. I hope you can be on time. We'll start at 1045, and there will be a number of things throughout the service a little bit different than we normally do. Uh, so it will be a wonderful time with Rebecca then. And then those who are part of the council will be invited to come and to lay hands and to pray for her toward the end of the service. As we just want to confirm again her calling, that we see that this is something God has called her to, not just at our church. We believe that it's a calling on her life, as well as... Uh, we want to just give her a blessing as we pray for her and pray for her ministry. We think it's important that we do these things as a body of Christ. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask me, to ask Bjornar. He's the head of our deacons. He, of course, was there as well. Um, and we'd be happy to take time to explain and to share with you more about that experience. And um, be praying for Rebecca this week as we prepare uh, for next Sunday.